Hey everyone, welcome to episode 99 of the Ceres podcast. I'm your host, Stelios, and the director of Ceres Pure Food Innovation. How's it all going? I hope everyone's really busy. How are you finding it with this very sensitive track and trace at the moment? I got pinged a few weeks ago, which was pretty frustrating as I just had to sit at a house and work from home, which was mental. But hey ho, what can you do? So, little Ceres update, nothing major. We're adding some new items to our online shop very soon. Also, did you know, I said this in our last episode, did you know that if you join our mailing list, we will send out a discount coupon code once a month. We don't hassle you, don't spam you, just once a month. It's worth being on the mailing list just for that, to be honest. We won't be giving out coupon codes or social media, so you really have to be on the mailing list to get this. So just to join the mailing list, go to our Instagram page, Facebook page, whatever, click on the link and it should give you the option there. Now also keep your eyes peeled for these new products. They're nothing major, just really good, easy Ceres solutions as we call it. So we've started slotting in these little adverts at the beginning of each podcast and a little bit at the end. We will never insert ads in the middle to break the conversation. We hope this is cool with you. It gives us a chance to highlight and support what we do, but what others do too. They've supported us privately with this podcast in the background. Now we're allowing them to do so publicly. Everyone in the food business is busy. We know that. You also balance the need for making more profit by selling unique food to customers. In our view, you should make profit when you're closed and sales when you're open. Let's just cast our minds to butchers for the moment. They don't only sell fillet steak, do they? They have multiple cuts and then they have the trimmings that go into sausages. Think of how they turn a low value ingredient into eight pound a kilo. The Ceres fish cake mix is the solution to increasing your profits on your premium product, let's say fish. You know, why give ingredients more than they deserve just to ruin your gross profits? You know, they just think, oh, I'll get a big piece of fish, you know, or you cut it off and it goes in the bin. You can now trim the fish to the perfect weight and the perfect size and not worry about what to do with all the trimmings. By making homemade fish cakes, you can increase profits and sales at the same time. I know what you're thinking. I could just use potatoes and chips that I've got on site. The fact is, by the time I even brought them to the boil, you'll be finished using the Ceres fish cake mix. We have put together so many recipes for you to get started. You'd be crazy not to increase loyalty and profits by serving homemade fish cakes unique to your business. Increase your sales and profits today. Order the Ceres fish cake mix from worldofceres.com. This episode is also brought to you by Bizimply. Are you fed up with managing the complexity of staff rotors? I know I hated it. Increased labour costs, that's got to be a problem today. And are you worried about not keeping up with HR? This is the biggest risk in my view. I know firsthand how hard managing staff is. I remember it was stressful doing the staff rotors. I was always rushed up against it. And then the managing of HR came in. This is the difficult thing. If you get anything wrong with HR, you're in serious, serious trouble. So, Bizimply is here to help. Bizimply is the all-in-one operations, HR, rotor, and workforce management software designed and run by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. Bizimply offers you a drag-and-drop solution. No more stressing around. There is a Time Station app that prevents time theft and buddy punching. The MyZimply app gives you live time and attendance, but also tells your colleagues what their shifts are and roles are given for that day. Bizimply has so many key features, it's hard to say which is best. I love the fact that it has payroll integration. You can just connect it with Zero, for argument's sake, which is software that a lot of people use, maybe even Sage. You know, that is, for me, a big thing. Integration, POS, you name it. If everything can work together, you've got lots of data. And, you know, we're going to talk about data in the next podcast, which is real big at the moment. So, in my view, Bizimply is so needed. So, what do you need to do? Stop getting stressed about it. Get in touch with Bizimply. Visit bizimply.com. Stop stressing. Join up. Get it sorted. So today's podcast guest is the food futurist, Tony Hunter. I've been following Tony for a while on LinkedIn and Twitter. I just, I love what he's sort of saying. You know, I'm scared of some of it, you know, but I like what he's saying. You know, we've got to start looking at the future when it comes to food. So he's a global futurist and consultant specialising in the future of food. He helps businesses future-proof their teams and organisations. He is a passionate believer of agri-food tech, offers a massive opportunity to solve the problems of sustainability and feeding the growing global population. 
Tony travels the world using his unique combination of scientific qualifications and 30 years of business experience to convey to businesses and event audiences how new technologies will influence the food industry. This combination of skills and knowledge gives him the unique viewpoint of the future of food. Tony works with companies closely to create and implement the future based plan so they can make the best possible decisions to maximize their short, medium and long term profit. If you want to follow Tony Hunter, then look him up on Twitter or LinkedIn. We will link to him in our show notes. On to the podcast. I really hope you enjoy this one. Tony, welcome to the Sarah's podcast. Thanks, Elliot. It's great to be here. Yeah, you know, it's it's great to have you. I've been following you on Twitter for some time and LinkedIn, actually, a little bit less than Twitter. But I've just, you know, I've seen you for a while and I thought oh, I definitely want to get him on the podcast. Uh, thanks. So just give us a little bit of background of your day to day. What it is that Tony Hunter, the food futurist, does? Yeah, well, as you say, Stelios, when people ask you what I do and I say I'm a food futurist, the first question is usually, what does that mean? And well, basically, in a nutshell, what I'm doing is looking at all the cutting edge and new technologies and seeing how that's going to affect companies and the food industry generally. And then for my clients over consulting side by business, it's about how is that going to get them competitive advantage in the marketplace? Because you can imagine, if you can look into the future and be reasonably certain what's going to happen six or 12 months ahead of your competition, that's a major competitive advantage. Yeah, I guess it is, especially six to 12 months doesn't sound like a lot, but in a business, that can be a real big differentiator. Yep, absolutely. Do you think, you know how we, I was reading an article this morning about microchips and, you know, microchips, there's the Moore's law and, you know, it tells you how fast you can sort of replace the old technology and double it with the new technology. Is that similar to food technology, do you think? Are we seeing sort of that growth, that technological growth in food? Look, I think so, Stellas. I think if you go back 10 or 20 years ago, I mean, food was a pretty sleepy industry. You know, you got two or three percent increase in sales, two or three percent drop in operating costs. Everybody went to Tahiti for the next conference. Whereas now we're seeing a whole different ball game. Really, my belief is food is now technology. And as you say, if you look at technology, technology grows exponentially. So the phrase I have is, is food is exponential, exponential technology. And I think the best example of that is, has been COVID. And COVID's shown us that it's very dangerous to live linearly in an exponential world. And what I mean by that is if you look at the infection rate, say, for COVID, if you think there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, when in reality it's one, two, four, eight, sixteen, you're out by a factor of over three, another doubling, and you're at 32 versus six, you're out by a factor of over five. So if you're living in a linear world and you're just saying the next two or three years are a linear extension of the last two or three years, very dangerous, particularly at the moment in the food industry. Some of the technologies are outpacing Moore's law. Wow, that's really interesting. One thing I was thinking when I was reading up on doing my research and trying to sort of get my head around certain things it just struck me is that it's an odd thing to get into food futurism how does someone get into that job like what sort of path did you take to get there well i suppose go back to you know where i started from my background's food science and technology i've always been interested in innovation in new technologies, whether it be food. I mean, I build my own computers. I get a box full of parts and put them together and do the whole thing. So I've always loved technology. And go back to about 2017, the dim, dark past of 2017. You know, I, I started to look around and seeing some of the newsletters that we all get 
in our industry, you know, newsletters, food navigator, whatever we get. And so to see these technologies coming along, the plant-based was a little bit ahead. And then I came across cell-based technology, which is where you actually grow meat. You take a small biopsy from an animal and you actually grow meat in huge stainless steel fermenters. And I went like, wow, okay, things are changing. This technology, which basically comes out of the medical field, is coming into food. And I saw at the beginning of 2018, the first conference from the Good Food Institute, who are a group that support and look at the growth of plant-based, cell-based, and fermentation-based proteins. And I went along to that in San Francisco. I said, if I'm going to serious, I better go and have a look. And wow, that really pushed me along the road. And I thought, well, okay, but who's telling companies that these things are happening? I've got the time. I'm a consultant to do this sort of thing and see what's going on. How do companies keep up? And I asked some people that I knew in the industry, how do you keep up with all the new technologies? The most common answer was, I don't. I can't keep up. I'm so busy at the next quarter and the year's results and head down doing all these things, running the business. I don't really have time to look over the horizon. And so I had a look around and I Googled food futurist. And you can probably count them on the fingers of one hand globally. People who specialize in food, lots of futurists who will tell you about food and flying cars and blockchain and AI and, 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 and but who's people who specialize, there's probably certainly less than 10 globally. I was over at the Food Matters Summit back in 2019, and their normal food futurist from the UK wasn't available. So they flew me in from Australia. <laughs> they couldn't just pick up another one. So that's how I came over and talked at the Food Matters Summit. So there's not many of you then? Nope, not that specialise in food. And I mean, that's where my, I suppose, unique point of view comes in is with my background in food science and technology. I've been GM of two food companies. I've got my own consulting company. And my day usually starts with spending a couple of hours researching what's changed since I was on there yesterday morning, because if I miss a week, <laughs> I'm totally screwed. <laughs> Do you think the cell-based meats have come along a long way? Because I think a few years ago, what was it? I think four ounces was costing a quarter of a million pound. What, what, how far have we come along since then? We're talking about a chicken breast for US $7.50 mm. from that, which is still a lot, but that's mm -hmm. exponential drop in the pricing. And the interesting thing there is the next couple of years are going to be extremely interesting, both for plant-based and cell-based. There's a lot of pilot plants coming online. So we've got pilot plants from a company called Wild Type, who are doing salmon, Blue Nalu, who are doing mahi-mahi fish. We've got Future Meat Technologies, who are doing cultivated fat cells, Mosa Meats, who are coming along with their beef, and Upside Foods with their beef as well. So there's a lot of pilot plants coming online. Now, these are only making a few hundred kilos a week, but it's the next step. And once these pilot plants are up and running and they're generating data, which is what we really need, no one really knows definitively how this is all going to work and pan out when we scale it up from a couple of thousand litres to two to 300,000 litres. So that's what's going to be really interesting. 2022 is going to be a really interesting year as all these things come online. I mean, as you probably know, we saw in Singapore back in December last year where they approved the sale of the first cell-based product in the world in Singapore, a chicken nugget from Eat Just. And you can get on Food Panda in Singapore and they'll deliver you your cell-based nuggets. Hmm. So that's where we're at. And nutritionally, is the cell-based chicken the same as normal chicken? Let's say. I don't use the word normal, but I just mean animal-raised chicken, I guess. Conventional chicken, yes. I mean, it, it is animal cells grown in a fermenter instead mm -hmm. of grown in an animal. So nutritionally should be exactly the same as the conventional product. I think because for me, like that's one of the issues that I find sort of like uh, the plant-based meats, let's say plant-based proteins mm. that, you know, there are agglomeration of different sort of, you know, oils and this and that and starches and, and you're just not going to get the same nutritional profile, no way near. They're going to be high carb, high in processed oils. Whereas if the cell-based product is, like you say, the same, then you've got rid of the thing that maybe most people feel most sort of offended about, which is killing an animal, I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think look with the plant based, because food is now technology, what we used to have in the old days, if you made a product in your big FMCG company and it goes on the market and it sells, the mantra was no one changed the formula. Anyone who changes the formula on that product gets fired. Now we have Beyond Meats last month, version 3.0. So they're hearing things from the consumers, like you're saying, Stelios, where, okay, there's too much of this in it. There's methyl cellulose, which we don't want in this and that. But you just go back to when I was at that GFI conference three years ago, where someone from Impossible Foods was there, I talked to, saying our biggest problem is that we're stuck with what the products are in the market. No one in 2018 was going to do anything special for a plant-based meat company. It's too small. It's insignificant. Why would I bother? Now everyone, their dog wants a slice of the plant-based market. You've got Unilever in there. You've got Nestle in there. You've got JBS. You've got Tyson. All the big meat and food companies are in the space. And now all the ingredients companies are suddenly going, oh, okay. If we make something specifically for that industry, we're going to get sales out of it. And every time a big ingredients company jumps into the market, it boosts up the R&D and other resources to the whole sector itself. So we're seeing the lists of ingredients come down, being simplified. We're seeing things like, okay, we don't want so much processed products in there. And I think that you're right, that we do need to make sure that it's a drop-in decision for consumers. We don't want consumers, okay, if you eat a plant-based burger, now you have to get some nutrients from over here and some other ones from over there to make up for what you're not getting. For consumers, it shouldn't be any compromise. They should go, I either buy this and I get that set of nutrients, and if I buy this, I get the same set of nutrients. So that's where the bioavailability, the micronutrients, the B12s, all that sort of stuff needs to be in that product. So it's a, just a straight substitution and not asking consumers to compromise by doing other things. Yeah, I think when I look at the likes of Impossible Foods and all of that lot, they've been quite clever because they never wanted to be vegan, as in they didn't want to be lumped into the no. vegan section. You know, they want to be next to the meat in the fridge. And it's very clever, really. But I think anecdotally, one thing that I always look for when I go to supermarkets, I always look at the plant-based offerings. I never eat them purely because I, I don't like them, if I'm honest. Yeah. Like, I've tried them and they're just not my thing. And I look at all ingredients listings all the time because, again, I'm in the food industry yep. and it just I always look at stuff like that. And, and I think you're probably quite similar in that respect. One thing I've always noticed, though, that always in the, the sort of have this section at the end of the fridge where I guess they have a dry section, too, where they get rid of things on the cheap when it's coming close to its date. And it's always a big pile of plant based things. And, and I do wonder if there is a bit of a hidden bubble somewhere that they've got all the sales, but actually is not translating to sales at the bottom end. Mm. And I know it's only anecdotal, but I visit a lot of supermarkets and I always see plant-based things reduced, reduced, reduced. And I do wonder if, yes, you know, Impossible Foods sold it to someone like Tesco, which is a big supermarket mm. over yep. here, or the co-op and so on. But then did it translate to a final sale? Mm. And I don't think it always does sometimes. I know it's anecdotal, I've got no evidence there. I agree with you. I mean, I've tasted a lot of plant-based products and I wouldn't go back for the vast majority of them mm. because they are simply not there yet. But the thing that I always say is, look, even though there may be at best a six out of 10 compared to conventional meat and they're on occasions two or three times the price, they still command billions of pounds and dollars worth of sales. Mm. So imagine when they are a 10 out of 10 against a conventional product. Imagine when they're 11 out of 10. Who says that a conventional meat burger fried on the grill in the fry pan is the best tasting product you can have. Mm. Who's to say that in two to three years time, I'm saying 2025 is taste parity. And after that, it's 11 out of 10 versus meat because they'll find out what people really love about mm. their conventional hamburger and they'll put more of it in plant-based or they'll complement it with something else. And then plant-based products will then become their own product no longer compared to conventional meat products do you think in your mind do you think cell-based makes veganism or plant-based redundant i think there will be people who will say no i want to eat more plant-based because i feel that's healthier for me and there will be people i think for whatever reason people want to eat meat whether it's cultural 
or physiological, people want to eat meat. And no matter how good you make a plant-based burger, I think there's a section of the population, I don't know how large that is, whether it's 5%, 10% or 50%, who are going to say, just knowing that it's there, that it is plant and not meat, it's not the same. It's like we, we get the English lifestyle shows over here. And the thing we laugh about the most is how people in the UK hate bedrooms downstairs. And the lady sitting in one of these shows, yeah, I know that the bedroom's downstairs, it's all okay, but I just know that it's downstairs, so I can't buy the house. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's the same thing. It tastes like meat, it looks like meat, it bleeds like meat, but I know it's not meat. I want meat. Yeah. To me, there's something in there. That's why I think cell-based is the potential to be the real game changer. And there will be plant-based, there will be cell-based, and they'll be conventional for a long time because we've got such a huge growth in the protein requirements as we go towards that 10 billion people. Maybe a cliche in some ways, but it doesn't make it any less true. Rising middle classes, same thing. We're going to need more protein. So it's going to coexist for a while. And how that will shake out, whether it will be like, you know, if you look at the studies, you've got people predicting factors of 10 differences, what it's going to be by 2040, 2050, what the mix is going to be. comes down to what we were talking about prior to on the show, Stellis. No one really knows the future. Mm. All we know is there's these three things at the moment in the mix. We've got plant-based, cell-based, and conventional, and that's what we usually look at. But I'll tell you the big one to watch, mycoprotein, which is the mm. protein made from fungi. Mycoprotein, and corn is the best example. The technology has been around for decades, but there's a whole new range of companies like Enough out of Glasgow who are supplying Unilever, Mycoprotein for their vegetarian butcher lines. You've got a company called Better Meat Co. in the US, their riser product, which is for adding to meat products to get the extension and the flavor and so on to those products. Mycoprotein is the one that I'm seeing that is the sleeper that's really coming out. There's a, I think there's a meteor a company, they're planning to produce millions of kilos of product by 2022. And you can grow a cow in a few days in microprotein terms. Wow. Here we are, I'll just grow you a cow. Come back in a few days, I've got a cow-shaped lump of mycoprotein for you. Very good amino acid profile, very bioavailable. Not a hard sell to people. Mycoprotein, fungi, like mushrooms, is not a hard sell compared to a whole new technology like cell-based. That's really got to be transparent and got to be sold to the consumer, the advantages and everything else. So my tip is mycoproteins are one we're going to see make huge strides in the next few years. And what do you call a product that's got plant protein and mycoprotein? Is it still plant-based if plant-based is 51%? Mm. <laughs> mm, yeah, I guess. Myco burgers. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound so strange, though, to be fair. And I guess the image in my mind is just a mushroom. I know it's not yep. technically yep. because it's the microprotein is technically what's under, is it? That, it's the mycelium. That's isn't it? right. So, yeah. But it's not a hard sell, is it? You know? No, it's not a hard sell. I'd rather have that than insect protein any day of the week. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like, there's certain things that you shouldn't test. Insect protein just doesn't, yeah. <laughs> well, I tell you, I, I went up, did a conference and spoke at a conference in Thailand. And I tried the hot and spicy crickets and the sesame seed silkworms. I tell you what, they weren't bad. Slightly nutty flavor. If you can get over what they look like, it's just like a crunchy snack. <laughs> that, I, I can't get over what they look like. <laughs> Yeah, but you see, I can't eat blue cheese either. I can't get it close up my mouth. The, the smell, yes. just, I, I can't eat blue cheese. I'd rather eat an insect. But yeah. I would eat a whole packet of deep fried crickets before I'd eat blue cheese. But you're talking to a guy that is irrational when it comes to things like this. Like, you know, in the middle of the night, if there was a moth in my bedroom, I would jump on the bed with a towel to kill it whilst my wife is trying to sleep. Like, I, I, that is just me all over. So it's like, yeah, I'm just irrational about things like that. Yeah. But I think, but again, do you think I'm a product of an overly fussy person that lives in the West and who, who's had no starvation, nothing to worry about? Like, you know, I can go to a supermarket, pick up some pork belly. I can go and pick up some, you know, chicken breast or chicken thigh. Am I a product of that, that generation that doesn't have food issues? Well, I think we're all a product of our culture. There are 2 billion people in the world that regulate insects. 2 billion. So wow. if you add up most of Europe, 
US, Australia, UK, we're probably in the minority that don't eat insects of some way, shape or form. You go to markets in Thailand, there's a whole raft of fried tarantulas, fried this, fried that, people snack on and crunch them. So, you know, it's a cultural thing, I think, more than anything else. Yes. The other interesting one is, of course, you know, we call them, is it shrimp in the UK and we're prawns down under? Prawn. It's a prawn. Prawn, here. prawn there. So like, just think about it. Think what a prawn looks like. It is a bizarre-looking creature, those big black eyes, the long antenna. And how do we eat them? First of all, we break their body off and throw it away. Then we pull their skeleton and legs off the outside and their tail. Sometimes we pull their intestines out, sometimes we don't, and we dip them in sauce and eat them. <laughs> you, you're, really, you're really trying to pop your prawns, aren't you? I love prawns. <laughs> The thing is, like, <laughs> prawns and insects have a common ancestor. We're eating an yeah. insect from the sea. Culturally, yeah. we see no problem with it, right? Go back 30 years ago, who would eat sushi? You're going to eat what? Raw fish? Go back to the 90s. Mm. Now, you tell someone you're going to eat sushi? So what? It's not even worth mentioning, is it? No. What did you have for lunch? Oh, sushi. Was it nice? Yeah, okay. So they're not quite the same, but it just shows how culturally you can come to accept things which were considered really weird and strange, you know, only a decade or so ago. So it'll be interesting to see where that comes up. But the, the thing is, I think you know, probably in the UK, same thing in Australia. First thing you see an insect is reach for the insect spray, spray it and kill it. You don't think of picking it up and having a snack. Mm, that's fairly true i think the only difference is well, i guess and this is how i probably reconcile it is one is in the sea and it's fresh water or seawater and the other one is under a cupboard somewhere so it's like, <laughs> you know but, very true but no i think you're right i think i think you are right i think we we do have the benefit in the western countries or as they say in the first world countries of being snobbish about food whatever we say like and and i think we can't truly understand what other cultures do you know, look at what China does with food. Everyone turns their nose up at it, but they've got a huge population base, and I guess they've got to do things in a very different way, haven't they? As you're saying, culturally, quite different approach to food. I mean, it's only yeah. in this last few decades that we've had true globalization and, you know, of an understanding of what other countries and other cultures do. Before that, you maybe read it in a book, you certainly didn't Google it, and saw it in a magazine, National Geographic, was how you learned what happened in, you know, the old paper, National Geographic, what happened overseas. Yeah. You didn't have it on your supercomputer in your pocket, as smartphones. You couldn't see a YouTube video of it. You, you, maybe you got some pictures from a friend who spent thousands of pounds or dollars going to Asia and took a couple of happy snaps to show you what it was like. And that was your exposure to how other cultures ate. Yeah. Now it's entirely different. Do you think with the cell-based meats, would it make using antibiotics redundant or do they still need some form of antibiotics? The, at the moment, no one is saying they're going to use antibiotics. They're saying that is one of the big upsides that the cell-based companies see is they don't have to use antibiotics. So again, when we see this scale up, we'll be able to see the truth of that. But everyone I talk to in the cell-based company says, we are not going to use antibiotics. We're not going to need to use them. They don't use antibiotics in the big biopharma companies who are the, the medical equivalent to growing a cell-based meats. They use all sorts of mammalian cells. Chinese hamster ovary cells are one of the favorites for growing biologic products, which is used to, to treat disease. So, you know, mm. that's the thing. See, in my mind, like, and I, I don't know if the volumes are too big, but if there's anybody that wants this sort of thing to work, it's a company like McDonald's, isn't it? it you know, a company like McDonald's surely would want to remove, you know, any barrier to sales by saying, oh, you know what, we now plant-based or whatever, or cell-based, you know, and I think cell-based sort of makes sense for a company like McDonald's, doesn't it, in some respects? They have to be very careful of their consumers. So that's that's the key thing. If you have a look at plant-based as an example. It took quite a while before anyone, Burger King or McDonald's, jumped on the plant-based space. They waited to see what was happening, and I think they will wait to see what happens. The one good thing for the QSR companies, the fast food companies, is going to be stability of price. They will know what the price of their meat's going to be for the next X number of years, whereas at the moment, 
meat is a globally traded commodity. Mm. Changes in the US dollar exchange rate, if it snows in the Midwest of the US, if Australia has a drought because we export 70% of our beef. So whatever happens in the world, the price of meat goes up and down depending on what's going on. So stability of price could be one of the most attractive things for the QSRs. They'll be able to get the price, get it low and maintain it there and not have as many variables determine the price of a Big Mac or a Whopper. I was told the other day, well not the other day, I've never known for a while, but apparently McDonald's can hedge their prices for five years at a time. You know, so that makes you wonder, like, how long could they hedge it for if they had cell base? Yeah, look, I mean, let's see if they're, if they're managing to do that. I worked for a company that made hamburg patties for McDonald's and three months was a long time in the meat game to hedge your price. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, three months is a long time. As I say, it just takes a change in the exchange rate for whatever reason or a I say, bad year in the in the US for the either their corn or the animals and suddenly prices all over the place. So maybe they have found mm-hmm. a way to do that through the futures exchanges or something like that, but it is very difficult. I'd also imagine that just because they've hedged it doesn't mean it's hedged all the way. It doesn't mean that the farmers protected themselves. They know no. that they're yeah, they're probably the ones that are going to pay for that. Mm. Essentially, yeah. Look, I mean, it's really difficult for the farmers to know what to do, and do they restock? Do they not? They've got a drought. There's a drought. They have to turn more animals off and send them off to slaughter, which means then they've got to then go into a herd rebuilding phase after that. So it's it's you know it's not a not an easy life being a, a cattle farmer. I think anywhere in the world. No, no. I I just think I think farming's had a real bad rap, but I do think there is something honourable about what they do to this planet because they, you know, if done right, obviously, mm. if done correctly, you know, they're rearing animals. You know, is is that full cycle? You know, and I know it's obviously been abused in some parts mm. of, of the world, but I think for the most part, it is that full cycle. We eat the meat, you know, it all returns back to the land and it goes back around the circle, doesn't it? Look, I think you're right. Whatever the problem is or the question is farmers are the answer because they are the people who grow the fundamental building blocks of food whether you want those fundamental building blocks to be plant-based animal-based combination farmers are the answer and i think our definition of a farmer may change over some time i mean one of the big ones i think that's got a lot of potential is also algae Mm -hmm. and when you grow Algae, it's probably not much good in the UK, but to grow algae, what you need is large amounts of land, very low rainfall, lots of sunlight and close to the water. And I can think of lots of areas in northern Australia which fit that and areas in the Middle East that fit that where you don't have that and you've got, because seawater is great, you don't want rainfall to dilute the algae. You can use seawater. So the twin tyrannies of food production are availability of arable land and fresh water. Countries that have both of those have food. Countries that don't have those, or not a lot of it, don't have much food and food security. So Mm -hmm. a lot of these new technologies don't require arable land at all, and or they don't require much in the way of fresh water. So anything of that's going to lead to more food security and sustainability for countries whose populations are growing quite rapidly over the next few decades. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense because Greece is a very big grower of algae is that the right term growing would you grow algae? yes you grow algae yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. so yeah that makes sense because you, they actually fit what you just said they've got low rain high heat you know next to the sea yep so it sort of makes sense yep. really. and i mean we've got the macro algae which are the ones we see on the beach the kelp and the, things like that and then the micro algae which are the very small ones which you can use for things like protein you can also use them to grow ingredients and other products as well they make all sorts of interesting and wonderful ingredients can be made from algae so they can be carriers almost well they actually produce the product if you can manipulate their biochemical pathways and you can do that via the light wavelengths that you expose them to you can get them to produce certain biological products like ingredients or oils for pharmaceuticals for cosmeceuticals and things like that and then you can also grow them for their protein content. So you can grow them in bioreactors, photobioreactors, where you have big, imagine big, long glass tubes, big S shape, light on them. You can get them to produce products. And that algal bioeconomy, you can even use algal protein to make alternative protein burgers. 
So that's been done. You put that in with the plant-based and it actually improves the amino acid content and the profile of the product and leads to a different type of structure and texture to the product as well. So there's all sorts of technologies coming out now. It's weird because a few years ago, a chap that I know was telling me about, he was working on a team where they made a frying oil, so a heat stable oil. So I guess high in monounsaturates mm. or high in saturated fat from algae. Yeah. Yep. And I, I just couldn't get, get my head around it. I, I just thought, well, how? Like, And now that you sort of said it, it actually sort of makes sense. And, yeah. And he said they've been trying to bring it to market, but they've not sort of done it yet. Look, there are hundreds of thousands of strains of algae in the world, literally. And we've only explored a bare handful of them and what we can do with them. So I think algae in the longer term are going to be really important contributors to food and food ingredients over the next decades. Wow. And I think we've got the ability with these new technologies to reimagine the whole food system. I mean, it's like we were talking before, Stelios, about, you know, culturally, well, why do we eat so many animals and why do we eat only four or five crops? That's the way it's become through accidents and through intention and everything else we have. But there's nothing magical about getting our protein and other requirements from animals and plants. As we talked about before, there's mushrooms, there's algae. There's all sorts of things that can be used now with these technologies to make the food and make them far more efficiently than we're able to do them currently. Mm. I think that what's happened there is, you know, you mentioned it last week on the phone, like, you know, in the 50s, a chicken was grown to like 900 grams. This really shocked me. Like, I knew it was small, but I didn't realise how small. So 1957, my dad was born in 1957, uh, chicken was about 905 grams yeah. when it was slaughtered. And in 2005, it's around 4.2 kilos. Like, <laughs> and, and it's almost like the farmers, the feed processors have figured out how to make a certain protein grow fast. And I say protein, yeah. but it's the animal, yeah. and then think, well, you know what? Let's do more of that. It's got cheaper and cheaper, yeah. whereas chicken a long time ago was a treat, yes. and now people have it once a day. It's now the cheapest, most efficient protein on the planet. I Like you, my wife and I were just talking about the other day, we remember when chicken was the upmarket thing to have. You had a roast chicken. That was pretty upmarket stuff, hey, you know, like, but not anymore. It's now the cheapest, most efficient protein on the planet. And a lot of genetics has gone into that. A lot of breeding has gone into that as well to, to make that happen. I mean, we slaughter around about 66 billion chickens a year. Wow. So, Mentally. yeah, it's like nine times the human population of the planet. As they say, if they come, if the aliens come in a million years' time and look at the fossils, the chicken will be the one they find the most of. That'll be the fossil yeah. for the Anthropocene, will be chickens. I just find that 360% growth in weight, it's just, it's mental. When you actually apply the logic, you know, I'm, I'm a bit younger. So for me, when I was growing up, salmon was yeah. the, the posh thing. If you said you had salmon, you were either really rich or it was Christmas. You know? <laughs> and again, now salmon has become, you know, overgrown or whatever people, I don't know, farmed salmon, it, you know, I've seen some terrible stories about it, but it's it become abundant. Mm. It's become just, everyone can have it. Yep, you can just walk into the supermarket. If you want some Atlantic salmon, same thing here in Australia. You can get salmon every day of the week. You can buy frozen imported Norwegian salmon, or you can get the fresh Atlantic salmon from Tasmania. So as you say, it's very highly abundant now compared to what it was. So after you told me that about chicken, I had to look at other ingredients. I just had to. <laughs> right? I couldn't help myself. And so I know it goes back a long time ago, but in 1270, the, <laughs> so year 1270, the, there was the first recording. The yield of wheat per field was half a ton per, it said hectare, but I calculated it back to yeah. acres. So 2.5 acres, half a ton per 2.5 yeah. acres. And in 2008, it was 8.5 tonne. Yep. per 2.5 and you just think the human race has really pushed mm. forward there haven't they oh absolutely i mean the green revolution of the 60s saved basically a billion people from starving now it's not to say it was perfect part of that with the huge amounts of synthetic fertilizers we use has caused dead zones in in the oceans runoffs nitrogen all sorts of problems but it did avert a billion people starving and it's what's enabled us to get those huge yields. 
But that's an interesting one too, because there's a couple of companies, Pivot Bio and Join, they have got microorganisms, a microbiome for the soil that you can spray on the soil and it can reduce your nitrogen usage by about 80%. And that means it doesn't run off. That means it gets used by the plants and the microorganisms in there partner with the plants, supply them with the nitrogen that they need. So there's technology again coming and saying, okay, we've got some problems with the current system. How do we make it more fit for purpose? And they're doing that way of getting the nitrogen to the plant by using a soil microbiome rather than piling nitrogen, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers on. And so therefore I wouldn't want to be in the synthetic nitrogen fertilizer business in a decade's time. Mm, they're probably already thinking about the next thing. Yep, they sold out in, in 2019. They, they sold out within months for farmers to try it. Oh, there you go. I watched the documentary the other day and it showed how farmers now have, you know, AI tractors, AI drones. I think it said something like, you know, it takes like one tenth of the amount of farmers than it used to 100 years ago mm. to produce, what, five, six times more yeah. product as well. So do you see a lot more use of AI and computers for farming, shall I say? Yeah, look, I think you're right there, Stelios. As you say, we're seeing it. You just everywhere you, you look, you hear about drones and say AI enabled tractors. We have one over here called the Swagbot, which will help you muster your sheep. You know, they had one there with a, the farmer. He was getting into his 80s and he's having trouble. He used to call the sheep, say, come on, come on. And the sheep would follow him and he'd take them to another field or wherever. So he got his swag bot, which is like, you know, about the size of a, I don't know, half a mini miner or something like that. And it goes in four wheels and they recorded his voice. After a while, it followed the swag bot because it was his voice over there and it just, they just followed it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so do you think humans can carry on with these exponential gains that we've had? Like, or is it just going to become more targeted, a less brutal approach? Every time we think we've reached the top of an exponential curve, something else comes along. It's like we were talking about before. Cell-based, five, ten years ago, I mean, they had the big cook-off on TV there in 2013, but then it pretty well, you know, it was, a, it was a bit of a novelty in a way it disappeared. Now, in 10 years, we'll have gone, as you say, from that, you know, quarter of a million euro or pound burger to, you know, it's going to cost 30 bucks. So look at, look at the exponential drop in pricing, and we haven't reached the end of that yet. I wake up every morning thinking I must have pretty well seen most of it by now, and every morning I'm surprised to find something else. So, you know, we may change from exponential changes in cell-based to exponential changes in other technologies. Once that becomes mature, something else will come along that's going to replace it or another area will then undergo its own exponential growth. And we're seeing a lot of convergence of technologies. Like I was saying, you know, you look at the cell base. So there's a lot of medical science, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology going into that from outside the industry. So we're going to see all these new technologies. Genetics is another one. And that's affecting the food industry because people are now getting their genetics tested for their nutrition. And they're then saying, OK, based on that, I want a certain type of food that suits me. And there's a couple of technologies over there in the UK, which I've been following for a while, which I find absolutely fascinating. One is a company called DNA Nudge. And you can go into London and you can go to their shop and you can buy a kit from them about the size of a shoebox. You take it home, swab the inside of your mouth, put it into the cartridge, put the cartridge in the shoebox. 15 minutes later, it's analysed your DNA, uploaded a code to your smartphone. You go to the supermarket, scan the food on the shelf, and it says, don't buy that cheese. This other cheese is better for you, given your DNA. And another company is uh, Vitamojo. They have some stores in London as well. You get your DNA done by DNA Fit, upload that to the app, walk into the store, punch the screen. It tells you because you're lacking a certain enzyme, you should have more of this goulash because it's got beef in it for vitamin b12 and you can select exactly what you want a personalized meal and within a few minutes similar to a qsl like mcdonald's or burger king there's your personalized meal sitting there for you so do you think that's 
probably to some degree the future of food where, you know, I might choose, for example, a keto diet. You might choose a low carbohydrate diet. Someone else may choose a high carb diet because their DNA tells them that's what they're more suited to. I think it's going to go further than that. I think the days of blanket diets like keto, paleo, even the Mediterranean diet, they are the walking dead. Because what we're finding is that our nutritional requirements are absolutely individual. So you and I can both eat a piece of chocolate and you're lucky your blood glucose does almost nothing. Mine goes through the roof. So you'd expect chocolate, but yours doesn't. So then we have a banana. Your blood glucose goes through the roof. Mine doesn't. You should eat chocolate, but steer clear of those bananas. They're not good for your blood glucose because we know that spiking your blood glucose is a precursor to diabetes. And it is that individual, which is why that diet your friend swears was fantastic for them. They lost five kilos, bulked up and felt the best ever felt. You put on three kilos and didn't sleep and felt like crap. You know, that's why, because your metabolism and your microbiome in particular is so unique to you. And this individual nature of our responses to food was done by the Wiseman Institute in Israel as one of the leaders. Day two is the company that does that. So what we're finding is how individual we are. Combine genetics with the microbiome, then we get a really good idea of what's good for us as individuals. Now, this technology, I'm not saying that some of this stuff is 90% even correct. It might be 50 or 60%. But to say, oh, therefore it's no good, would be like, don't bother developing the mobile phones we have today because they were a size of a brick and lasted half an hour 30 years ago. No, again, it's technology, and the technology will get better and better and more and more predictive. Uh And when you then converge with that AI and quantum computing, in 30 years' time, instead of a the mobile phone will be so outmoded. People will laugh how we ever got by with a smartphone like that when I've got my AI-powered quantum computer embedded in a chip in my arm, which tells me exactly what my blood glucose is doing, and I listen to it, and I don't eat what's bad for me because I can live without bananas. And some smart person will go, I wonder what it is in chocolate that sent Tony's blood glucose through the roof. How about I make a chocolate Mm -hmm. bar for people like Tony because there's a whole group of them that can't eat chocolate because of their blood glucose, I'll make something that doesn't do that for them. And then they'll service that part of the market. And we'll see all these individual solutions come on for people. And once they've got confidence that, yes, this really does make a difference to my health and what I'm doing, then people adopt really individualized diets And I'm talking here 2040, 2050. I'm not saying 2030 even. I'm saying it's going to take a long time for all these things to come together. But when all these technologies converge, it's going to change the way that we as individuals consider our food. At the moment, it's does it taste good and does it fuel me up? But we're seeing with COVID and everything else, people going, yeah, but is it healthy for me? Does it support my immune system? Should I be more plant-based? eating a bit more of this, a bit less of that. What should I be doing with my food to to stay healthy? And that's the difference. People are going to start eating for their health as much as they do for their fuel. And that's why I say to people, I say by 2050, there will be no food industry. Mm. But people say the question, well, but people have got to eat. I say, yes. But if people are eating for their health, what industry are food companies in? Mm. They're in the health industry. So we're going to see a convergence yeah. over the next few decades between food and health, and health will be a source of wellness, not a source of illness. At the moment, a lot of our food is a source of illness, isn't it? It's you know, mm. lifestyle diseases. When we start seeing food as a source of wellness, what it can do for us rather than, if you like, to us, then our attitudes to food will change. And once we're convinced of that, then that will change what we do. I think it's staggering that, you know, 100, 200 years ago, 1800s to 1900s, if you were poor, you were underweight and malnourished. Today, they say, you know, 200 years later, if you're poor, you're overweight and malnourished. You know, and imagine, (laughs) you know, and and it, because, you know, you, you can be overweight and malnourished, like, yep. you know, and I think that's, you know, we're not eating foods that are good for us. A lot of it is empty calories. Mm-hmm. 
a while ago, about a year ago, me and my friend, we wanted to try MCT oil. We read loads of benefits yeah. on MCT oil. And then actually when, when the hype sort of dies down, you read up on it, it's just an empty vessel for fat. There's no goodness to it. It's just an empty vessel. And same with sugar, isn't it? It's an empty calorie. Yeah. It gives you a nice little boost, you know, but then obviously dies away. So we've got a nation, well, we've got a world of people that have got bigger and unhealthier. So are you a fan of, you know, maybe government saying, let's subsidize vegetables and proteins and let's tax sweets and chocolate? Or do you think that's just too late? Just move on and just do food tech. One of my favorite ones was, I, I forget what country it was in Europe. They put a tax on chocolate. So people went across the border, filled up their boot with chocolate and came back. I know Denmark did a tax on saturated fats and cheese, so it could be similar. Could be similar. Yeah, I mean, so that's the thing. People will get what they want, and government's trying to tax it is a short-term sledgehammer solution. I think a far more elegant solution we're talking about here is the food tech solution. There's a company, now, unfortunately, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. They have an ultra-sweet protein. So it's the same sweetness from the, I think it's the Ubli fruit in Africa. They're now producing that via synthetic biology, and it's sweeter than sugar by a factor of about 100 and has virtually zero calories. And they say, according wow. to their tests, people like it as much or more than sugar. There's no bitterness. There's no aftertaste you get with stevia and some of the other ones, and it's a protein. So it has zero calories. And no insulin reaction? No, there wouldn't be because it's a protein. So it's not stimulating any insulin or anything like that. So, you know, you look at some of these technologies, again, why do we eat so much sugar? Because someone saw a sugar cane or a sugar beet, it tasted sweet. Over the centuries, we've worked out how to extract the sweet bit that we really like and throw it in things because people love sweet things and it makes us eat more, right? Mm. But now we don't have to do that anymore. This is what we've got to look at. And a lot of these things, we now have choices. We're not a slave to sugar cane or sugar beet. We've now got an alternative. And if I were looking at that from a government point of view, that's where the intervention should be. Right, let's have a look at this. Let's support that product. That product is better than sugar. Okay, let's punch hundreds of millions of pounds, dollars, whatever, into that technology to grow that technology. And if we have to have an exit strategy for the big sugar manufacturers, let's manage that because mm. we're far better off health-wise managing hundreds of millions of pounds of subsidies over the next five or 10 years to get the sugar manufacturers out of business and either get them to adopt the protein or whatever, if that's going to do the job. So, you know, the, I say, what's the best way to break a habit? Replace it with another one. What's the best way mm. to stop people eating so much of a product? Give them another one that replaces it that's just as good for them and better for yeah, them. That makes complete sense. You know, if the government said to take and lie off for argument's sake, oh, you know, you can carry on doing that, but we're going to tax you X or we can subsidise you to go and make this. Yep. That would be better, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. And you then know? because I mean, we don't want to see people out of work or out of jobs or anything else mm. any more than anyone else. But, you know, it's the old argument. Should there be a blacksmith on every street in the UK and Australia because the blacksmiths, the horses went out, we should subsidise and there should be blacksmiths everywhere? You know, it's the unfortunate mm. technologies change and things change. We're now in a situation, though, whether it's changing far more quickly, not generation to generation, but every few years things are changing and we need to manage that and we need to manage that change. And if we have to exit an industry, there needs to be a plan to help that industry exit and its workers to move on to something else. But technology is not going to stop. You know, if, why, why does a small Swedish company, well, relatively small, called Spotify, own a huge portion of the streaming music industry why isn't it sony music or someone else because they didn't see it coming did they mm. and now a small swedish company called spotify huge streaming company nokia look what yeah. happened to nokia i mean you know things change this is just unfortunately the way of the world but if we are to be humane about the whole thing we need to manage those changes that's when it becomes a disaster and people become disenchanted and you get all the pushbacks and everything is when governments don't manage that and don't look at it and i'm not sure in the uk but there's some countries like singapore and uae they have a minister for the future and their mm. job is to look at the technologies that are coming and how they're going to affect the country and i said there should be a minister for the future 
in every government around the world, searching out these new technologies and saying then, passing on to the Minister for Agriculture or the Minister for Health or whatever, these are the technologies that are coming and this is how it's going to affect it. What should we do policy-wise to take these changes into account? Because you can try and legislate it. They look what happened to the, the music industry. They actually tried to sue people who downloaded MP3s and tried to hold back the tide and say, that's what Spotify, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have that. So it's, yeah. it's not, you're not going to work. You're not going to work trying no. to legislate technologies out of existence. It's very unlikely to be able any effect in the long term. No, I agree. And I think, you know, you see the likes of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, you know, chocolate companies, and their, their argument is, look, you know, consumers have the freedom of choice. So they will choose what they want. And that is pretty true. But I think where customers don't have the choice, in my view, is with frying oils or oils, you know, that, you know, if you go to a restaurant, 90% of the time, restaurants are frying in, you know, liquid oils. In the 1900s, liquid oils were lubricant for tractors. And now we're consuming them, you know, and usually unwillingly, we don't know that they're using, you know, a highly polyunsaturated fat like rapeseed or sunflower. You know, obviously, I, I've always said fats are better for frying and oils are better for maybe a drizzle on a salad, but mostly lubricants. What do you see that, you know, the oil technology, where, where do you see that going? Anything on the horizon? Oh, I mean, the biggest one on the fat side of things is, of course, cell-based fats. So being able to grow okay. ch chicken fat. There's a company called Cubic in Spain who are scaling up cell-based fats, chicken fat with omega-3 fatty acids in them. So wow. that's one of the other things we can do with these sort of new technologies. We can make products that don't exist in nature currently. So we can say that you can have your hamburger you go to the restaurant, we go to the restaurant together, Stelios, and we order our hamburger and you want the one with low cholesterol because of your genetics or whatever and you don't care about saturated fat because you're fine. I'm the opposite. I don't care about cholesterol, but saturated fat's my thing. So you can theory get a hamburger exactly what you want with those ingredients. There's a company called Savor Eat out of Israel. They use 3D printing to make plant-based burgers, but they cook them simultaneously. So you can 3D print within three or four minutes a fully cooked plant-based hamburger with grill marks on the top. Wow. And depending what tubes they put in, they can put in the high cholesterol, the low cholesterol. So basically the same amount of time you get from your current QSR, you can get that printed on a 3D printer plant-based product. It's interesting. Yeah, I think the chicken thing. So I wonder how much chicken is in that chicken fat. Probably not a lot, I guess. Well, no, it is just the fat cells. So that's yeah, just, yeah, it's yeah. just, just the, I mean, like how how much of one chicken actually produces one? Yeah, how much does it start with? How much oh, does it make? You basically start with a grain of rice, and that if you want, if you can in theory take that on forever, and in a hundred years' time or a thousand years' time, you just keep taking that and keep doing it now there may be limitations we don't know about yeah but that's basically what you start with a grain of rice and that grows into kilos tons of product i know it might not be something you've thought about and it may be but what happens to animals after that who has chickens yeah no, no, no. it's very interesting people say that we're going to have all these animals running i said well no for the qsrs you slaughter the chicken after 32 days so if we stopped breeding chickens within about two months there'd be no chickens left mm. the eggs we wouldn't do the eggs get rid of the eggs there's no chicks there's no animals growing it's only a 32 day cattle 18 months i mean and it's not going to stop overnight it's not even suddenly overnight there's going to be all these chickens with nowhere to go or you know cattle roaming the streets looking for food it'll happen over a period of time and the cycle is so short now say 30 to 35 days is your standard QSR chicken. And to put in perspective, a chicken lives for about 10 years, right? So it lives about an eighth of what humans live. So multiply 30 days by eight, it's like your children living to nine months old. Yeah. That's the chicken's life expectancy is a nine month old human. And cattle is not much more. So potentially, if I've got what you've just said right, potentially, if cell-based meats do amazingly well yeah. and they save the planet from all the issues yeah. uh, and introduce us to a few more issues, because there is always going to be a, a trade-off, yep. are we talking extinction of those animals? 
if cell-based meat takes off and becomes dominant, then we're going to see a lot less cows around. Yeah. Whether they will disappear as a domesticated, industrialised species remains to be seen. Anyone who has a good plan of a point of difference in their animal products is going to survive the longest. If you grow organic product from black angus, etc., 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 and you've got a really good niche product, that's your best long-term survival. And we talked about before, chicken's the most efficient protein on the planet. So will it be the last one to disappear if they do, if animal agriculture does disappear? A lot of people targeting chicken, because a lot of people who see raising chickens and slaughtering chickens as animal cruelty, that's why they go after chicken, because we're killing 65 billion of them a year, and over 3 billion male chicks don't make it more than a day or two old before they go through the grinder. And that's one thing they're working on because that's what people don't... What happens, it's one of the things where you could say to be female, actually a big advantage because if you're male and you're a chicken, you ain't going to last long. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, there's, there's a lot of things there. But again, it's not going to be we're going to have the animals roaming the street if we stop eating animals. We, we kill them 30 to 40 days for chickens. And, I mean, pigs about six months. Cattle, you're looking at 12, 18 months. That's excluding dairy. Dairy, maybe five years. But, you know, it's and it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, if, ha if animal agriculture ceased overnight, we would all pretty well starve to death. We would not get our protein. Mm. There'd be huge amounts of micronutrient and diseases. There's just no way of scaling plant protein quickly enough to yeah. replace it. So it's going to be a very interactive process over the coming decade to see how things start shaking out and how consumers react to these products. I think plant-based has gone beyond a fat. It's no longer a fat. It's here to stay. Now, will it ever get yeah. to the you know, elimination of animal agriculture from some of the companies that want to eliminate animal agriculture and replace it with plant-based products? Will it do that? Or will it get to the one, like I said, I know it's plant-based. I want meat. I don't care how good it tastes, what it looks like. I, I, I want meat or, or not. Yeah. The answer is, Stelios, no one knows. And yeah. it, time will tell. If chicken is the most efficient protein, is palm oil going to remain the most efficient oil? There's a lot of pushback on palm oil at the moment. We talk about sustainable palm oil and everything else, but what I'm seeing in the marketplace is where companies can get rid of palm oil, they will. So that's not really a, an area I'm... Mm. highly knowledgeable in, but just anecdotally in passing, I see people where they can replace palm oil, whether it's certified palm oil or sustainable palm oil or not. I think companies are steering away from it. And again, it's one of those things that governments, where there's a lot of palm oil production, if they've got some incentives from new technologies for the farmers to, to grow something else, then that's what's going to happen. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting because I just don't see what can replace those yields. You know, a friend of mine's quite big in the in the oil industry, as in the food oil industry. Then he just says, you know, there's just nothing that remotely comes close to palm oil yield. It's three, four times behind its competitor. Yeah. And also it has a lot of functional properties as well. So, you know, if you're making a pie, you know, rapeseed oil isn't so great, you know, and, yeah. and I think that's one of the issues. And also you can use it in soaps, you can use it in yep. everything. But he said there is a lot of single source farms coming on, fair trade farms coming on. Mm -hmm. So the damage has been done, is yeah. what I think he's saying. And yeah. yeah, now it's been corrected. I think the thing is, algae is the one to watch out for there. If they Maybe. can produce an algal oil, because say there's nothing magical about palm oil. It just happens to be the best that we have at the moment to make yeah. the products that we make with it. And like I say to people, Nobody actually wants milk. What they want is a product they can put in their coffee, have in their cappuccino that tastes good. It can also go on some cereal and they can use for a bit of cooking. That's what they want. You give people a product that does all that and does it better and cheaper, they will buy that. Someone said technology or economics will kill an industry far faster than anything else. If I come along with a product that does exactly what milk does, and it's two-thirds the price, who's going to buy dairy milk? Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. You know, people don't want 
particular products. They want that because that's what they're used to culturally. That's what's available. That's the best of what's available. And the best of what's available, the benchmark for that's going to change in the coming decades. Mm. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think one of the big things that has been sort of touted a lot over the years is is GM, genetically yeah. modified. and mm. But it keeps getting off to a false start. A lot of people are scared of it. You know, I think in the UK it's banned. So what's your thoughts behind it? Because now we've obviously got CRISPR that's coming behind mm. it that's going pretty fast and people seem less scared of that. So, you know, what do you think about GM first? Well, GM... There was a lot of talk about all the disasters that would befall everybody from genetically modified crops. The genetically modified crops themselves, none of those concerns have come to pass. Now, if we look at the byproduct of putting glyphosates on and all the other things that go along with it, that has caused some problems, right? But the genetically modified crops themselves have not been shown that I know of and I've looked anywhere in the world to have caused a health problem for someone because it's genetically modified versus not genetically modified. Never come across, I can't find any scientific research that tells me that genetic modification itself is a problem. Associated things with growing the crop maybe, yes, but that's a different ball game. And if you have a look at, as you say, there's CRISPR, which is where we edit the DNA. So with genetically modified crops, often you put a foreign DNA from another organism into a plant or something else. And I can understand people have a philosophical problem with that. They think we shouldn't mess with nature like that. I can understand that. But people who go, GMOs are bad for us. And I saw something at a conference I was at a few years ago where they put up on the, the screen, they interviewed people in the streets in the US. What do you think of GMOs? Oh, GMOs are bad for you. Then they went through half a dozen people all saying the same. Then they asked them, what does GMO stand for? Some didn't know. Some got genetically. One got genetically modified but couldn't get the O. So just know that GMOs are bad for you. So there's no scientific basis for that. And the CRISPR, and there's a, another technique coming along called retrons, which are likely to surpass CRISPR in the ability to genetically modify organisms, crops, or anything else. And let's think about, though, people think, I think, they seem to think that, how do I get a, a new breed of wheat? I take a 1,000 or 10,000 seeds, I sow it into a field, I let it grow, I pick the best one that grows the tallest, the whatever the strongest, and I take that back and I combine that and put another one out. Well, no, there are about 2,500 crops that have been made through genetic modification already in the marketplace. But that's been done by mutagenesis. And what they do is they take the seeds, they put them in a container full of mutagenic chemicals, let it percolate for a while, sow them out and see which gives them what they want. Now, they've got no idea what other modifications have happened. They just know that it looks okay, it's bigger, it's stronger. Or the other one is you can re-radiate the seeds, cause mutation, and then go out and see what happens there. So do I want someone that's gone along and said, I've modified this individual gene and I know that's what's been modified and I can sequence it and show that or do I want someone that's thrown it in a bath of mutagenic chemicals and said yep that looks good to me I'm simplifying yeah. it I know but it's not all this you know clean and simple as people think it is they don't know what actually goes into some of the genetic modifications already in the marketplace and you can look that up it's the FAO and the International Atomic Energy Association on their website. Go find out. It's interesting because I think GMO, the biggest thing, you know, that people are scared about, I think, is pesticides. I think, especially with, I think, was it Roundup? Yep. Yep. Glyphosates. Yep. Yeah. Glyphosates. And they linked a seed that could only work with a certain glyphosate. And you think, like, I think that's probably what scared people, you know, in my mm. view, I think. But so so in your view, GM, the, the, the fear behind it is unwarranted almost. You should still be careful, yeah. obviously, but it's unwarranted. Yeah, I, I can't see any scientific evidence that the GM crops themselves are a problem. And if you look around now, there are other solutions. As you say, plants are made to resist glyphosates. You can now get, like we were talking about agriculture, a laser weeding robot that will work 24 7 and with a laser will identify and kill weeds with a laser 
Where can I buy one of those for? Because I could use it on my front drive. <laughs> yeah, it, it just you know, think Google this. Google it. It goes mm. around to hundreds of acres a day. It just goes along, uses AI pattern recognition. That's the weed with a laser, and mm. goes on to the next one. Gets that one. Gets that one. It just keeps going, and it just uses it GPS and everything else. Yeah, see, I'm not. I I think I sit on the fence when it comes to GM. Like, if I'm honest, yep. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's. But I think there's lots of benefits and I think there's lots of cons and I think done properly, it could be good. But I think, again, it's what happens when something becomes politicised. You know, it's everybody saying, oh, this, that, you know, insulin is almost exclusively made from GM, yep. I'd say. Yep. And yet I've not seen any negative effects to people taking insulin you know yep. my sister-in-law is type 1 diabetic my dad's type 2 diabetic they take insulin and i don't think they've ever had an option for anything that's animal derived because i think i read somewhere that animal derived insulin it's really hard to find and it's actually very bad for people whereas gm it's the one they use you know? yeah basically what they did back in the early 80s was to take the gene for human insulin put it into a microorganism the organism produces insulin you then get rid of the organism. So in theory, there's no GMO DNA in the insulin and use that to inject in, into people. It used to be truckloads of pig pancreases going around the countryside and extracting insulin from pig pancreases. But that wasn't going to happen for long with the rise in diabetes. And that was one of the first synthetic biology, genetically modified organisms. And the other one, of course, anybody here is listening who eats hard cheese, particularly in the UK and even in Australia, that's made with the product of a genetically modified organism. Because when you make cheese, you use rennet, mm -hmm. right? And that separates the curds and the whey. And the prime enzyme in that is something called chymosin. And back in 1992, Pfizer, our friends who do the vaccine, they came up with a way of putting the gene for chymosin from cattle into a microorganism, getting it to produce the chymosin, and then that chymosin would then be used to make cheese because the original rennet comes from the fourth stomach of a two to four day old dead calf. And, you know, most people that say like oh, killing lots of these calves to try and keep up with all the cheese is probably not going to happen. So therefore they came up with genetically modified organisms through synthetic biology that will make the chymosin. So I don't see any huge problems around the world with people eating cheese i love cheese as you say except for blue cheese except for blue except cheese. for blue cheese sorry yeah let me yeah it got, that's right still it's blue cheese except for blue cheese i see no problem with cheeks except for blue cheeses mold cheeses <laughs> that, that so we've we've been eating product something made with a product of a genetically modified organism for 30 years mm. the history tells us that these things can be done and done safely and the reason that it's been successful is partly because it's a B2B product. So it's business to business. Yes. No consumer has to look at it and go, do I want to make that one made with the two to four day old dead calf stomach? Or do I want the one made with chymosin? It's just, that's how it's made. Yeah, that makes complete sense. I think B2B, they can get it done faster. It works. It's mm. quiet. No one makes a big deal out of it. B2C, all of a sudden, everyone's screaming at each other. <laughs> Yeah. One, one of the things that we, we spoke about on the phone last week as well, which was intriguing, is that this goes back to the politicisation of food. After the Brexit negotiations, the UK did a trade deal with America. And in the negotiations, they were talking about importing American chicken, which was chlorinated. Yep. And so I, I know a few people in the chicken industry, and I was talking to a technologist, and he said, well, it can't be any different to the British washing chicken with sodium hydroxide, you know. Mm. And I did some research. Every chicken, apparently, that's grown in the UK gets a rinse with sodium mm. hydroxide, which is also called caustic soda or lye. Mm. Olives are turned black with sodium hydroxide. So it's not the end of the world. It's, you know. Yeah. And it was just, again, like two compounds, one's chlorine, one's sodium hydroxide. Then they're not overly similar but they're not dissimilar you know they're both cleaning agents i suppose yep. and yet everyone was making a big deal out of chlorinated chicken yeah like, you know yes i wonder if the americans would have an issue with sodium hydroxide chicken being sent to them they might do they <laughs> might do as you say i mean that's the thing it's an impossible dream but a nice one that if we could keep 
politics out of a lot of things and let the science do the talking, then we'd be a lot better off. Yeah, I think we discussed that pre-podcast, didn't we? That how how the COVID responses in all countries, if they weren't politicised, then it was just we're leaving the you know in our case the scientists and then HS to get it sorted, rather than our politicians giving us updates. And I think that's probably a bridge too far expecting our politicians to be giving us updates on stuff like that. I actually think yep. we should let the the people that are independent, that are also government backed but independent, they should be doing yep. it. In my view, yes, yeah, no, look, I I agree. They should also be above reproach. Mm. they shouldn't be you know tainted or or backed by commercial entities that should be no. you know, government. yeah that's my view no i mean we, we have a thing called the chief medical officer over here and they do a lot of the updates with the state governments and federal government they still you know the governments over here always say that they're taking the medical advice but then we're not transparent about it because what someone was saying what we should do is those people should put the medical advice up on the on the net so people can see what the advice is and then they can see how closely the politicians are following it or how they're making their decisions balancing off the medical advice so i think that would be an interesting way but again we're dreaming <laughs> Stelios, we're dreaming but you know this if you don't true. dream if you don't dream no, this is true. One last question before I let you go, because it must be getting late over there where you are, and I've just started my day almost <laughs> as such. Water consumption, you know, is there a problem there? Is it going to be a problem? Avocados take, I think, what did I write down? Two tons or 2,000 litres to make a kilo of avocados. You need 12 litres of water for almonds, and, you know, yeah, almonds are just, you know, everyone wants almonds at the minute. So, yeah. you know, do you see that being an issue, or is the technology starting to oh. Look, I think, I mean, you know, they're saying the next wars will be fought over water, not land. By 2025, two thirds of the world's population will be living in water stressed conditions. So water is a major issue. And again, come back to some of these technologies, absolutely minimise the amount of fresh water required to produce a kilo of protein or oil or whatever. So you're absolutely right. The fresh water arable land they're the two tyrannies that determine how much food we've got we've got the world resources institute saying that those who eat too much should stop eating too much and send it to the places that need it my reply to that is we've been telling people that they'll die if they eat too much food and they're still not prepared to eat less so what chance do you think we've got of saying eat less so we can send it somewhere else so my view is sustainably and equitably distribute the means of production of food don't try and take the places where we grow so much of it and then send it because of all the other problems of transport and greenhouse gases and everything else make it using technologies that don't need the arable land don't need the fresh water most countries will not be fully self-sufficient not if they want some particular crops like you're not gonna, I think your banana crop's fairly low in the UK from what mm -hmm. I sort of gather there. So if you want bananas, you're going to have... Pretty non-existent, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so that, that's, that's a bit of a problem if you want to eat bananas. But we can at least have countries who have a basic level of food security and food stability by using these technologies rather than trying to duplicate the mistakes that we've made in some of the industrialised countries and particularly with water you don't have too much problem with water in the uk we have had problems down here with was some droughts where we got pretty close to running our dams out of water i can tell you so water is going to be a problem i think people over here especially in the uk just can't get their head around water problems because not being funny yep. we drink water out the tap and then we shower with said water from the shower and we flush the toilet with said fresh water yep. so yeah you know we can't get our head around it and yet there's people that still go to a well every day and you know with a yep. bucket you know so you know i don't want to get all dramatic but we do actually have fresh water running through yep. our pipes here i could leave it on all day yes i pay for it but I'd nothing would happen yep. you know yep. so yeah and the, uh, the the other good one they've got at the moment is which is just starting off is something called hydro panels that can actually mm -hmm. use solar energy to extract water from the air and feed villages okay. so there's other technologies coming out now that's not going to fix the agricultural problem where you need massive amounts where most of the fresh water goes but i think drinking water 
we're getting very, very close to be able to solve that in the next five or ten years. No, that's good. But it's going to be agricultural water and, you know, as you say, using the same fresh water to flush our toilets and shower in and everything else and drink out of the tap, that's going to be a whole different ball game. But drinking water, I think there's some really good hope on the horizon for drinking water. But crops, that's a huge percentage. Of, don't oh, yep, It's 75% or something of all the fresh water in the world is used for crops. Mm. So you need a lot of fresh water. So I take it it's just too much for like desalination and UV. It's just too much for all that. Well, the costs of those at the moment are very, very high. Um, yeah. But the thing is, if you take into account desalination, it's probably not a good way of irrigating crops, but used to make cell-based meats could still be very good versus importing and everything else. So as I think there's a way of looking at a whole new food system other than what we've become accustomed to and what's traditional, if you like, and cultural in the industrialised countries. Mm -hmm. Oh, turn you on that note, mate. I'll let you crack on for the rest of the day. Yeah. Well, thanks got... very much, Tell us. No, I've, it's been really great having you on, mate. And I think people are really going to like, I, I found this really interesting. I love all of this conversation. I think some people will listen to it and think we're talking voodoo, but I actually think it's not going to be as far away as what people think. I think you're absolutely right, Stellas. It's closer than we all think. That's the only time I'm going to hear this year that I'm right. So I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife ain't going to tell me I'm right. So that's not going to happen, is it? So, <laughs> so Tony, have an absolutely great evening, mate. And we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot, Stellas. You have a great day too. Bye. Thanks for listening to that episode, episode 99. Wow, we're getting so close to episode 100. Big thanks to Tony Hunter, the food futurist, for joining me on the Sarah's podcast. If you want to follow Tony, then look him up on Twitter or LinkedIn. Just click away, Tony Hunter, food futurist. It's worth the follow. And we'll also link to him in our show notes. Big shout out to our episode sponsor, Bizimply. Visit bizimply.com today to reduce your staffing headaches. Take the hard work and the stress out of road to planning and employee HR tracking. The Serra's podcast is brought to you by the Serra's Pure Food Innovation. Have a great day.